Welcome to Senior Boys Bible Class. Uh, I am Mr. Blackwell. We will be uh, studying several doctrines uh, during the course of the semester, and then at the end of the semester you will switch and have Mr. Helder uh, for the second semester, or you've already had him and you've come now to me uh, during third quarter. But um, you'll need to be sure that you look on Google Classroom for a number of handouts, especially the notes that we're going over in class. Uh, you'll notice on the screen uh, the beginning of these notes and the pages are numbered <clears throat> though on the screen you cannot see uh, that number itself but um, page one doctrine notice the highlights they will only come into play here uh, if we choose to go to <clears throat> a written test uh, what we will be doing at the end of each doctrinal study is actually writing a doctrinal statement. You will be able to use the notes and I will give you more directions as we get close to that. Um, so keep that in mind, especially if you are at home, be sure that you also uh, double check with me if I don't cover it here. But basically, um, you're going to take the notes here and to write what you believe about a particular doctrine. In this case, we're beginning with the Bible and inspiration and then we will look at God and then we will look at man and sin, and that will cover uh, the first uh, quarter of our semester. Uh, now, you don't have to put in everything. It's what you believe. So we're going to hit some things in the notes about what others believe, and, and especially as we begin here, even just with the idea of doctrine, uh, some ways that people deny the truth of the Bible. So that's not something to put in your statement, but it's what you believe about the Bible, what you believe about God using inspiration. Then as we get to the second one, and we've studied the doctrine of God, then you would do the same and write what you believe about God. And you want to be sure that you're backing up what you believe with scripture references. Uh, so typically a good doctrinal statement may take you a good solid paragraph. It may take you a page maybe into two pages. Um, typically, if you're in the classroom, you're going to write these in class. Now, you are welcome to practice writing out what you want to say at home. Bring it in, copy it for me in the classroom, but that is your test grade. Um, or if you are at home, then you'll write it out and you'll send it to me, um, and I will grade it that way. We will also have verse quizzes. How we're going to de determine those for those of you that may be at home is still to be uh, discussed as we get into school. So we'll be sure that you know the details there, how you're going to handle that. And also then as we get farther into the notes, you're going to see a study on a book by John MacArthur called 12 Ordinary Men. Um, and again, you may or may not have this book in hand. It'll just depend on uh, our requirements for class, but we're going to discuss the 12 disciples by using this book. And what we will do there is we will use the highlights for the 12 ordinary men and we will quiz along each section. Uh, we are going to start with a quiz on just the introduction, so a short quiz. And then each quiz after that will, for the semester, will cover two chapters of the book. So you'll have a total of six quizzes that way for the semester. Uh, so verse quizzes, 12 ordinary men quizzes, the doctrinal statement, and then we'll We'll see what the school is going to do about Christian service, given where we're at right now. Um, they may not require it. We'll just have to see, and then I will let you know as well about that. And mostly, if you're at home, then I will be sure that you, I've written this out uh, in the Google Classroom, uh, either in a document you can download, or it will be shorter, and I can just place it there. But a number of documents at the beginning, the verse sheets, uh, these notes here you'll want to download. Um, if you're going to be in the classroom, you can print them, but we're going to try at least in the first quarter uh, to follow in this way, trying to uh, l narrow down what we need in the classroom. Typically, we would like for everyone, obviously, to have their Bible with them, uh, but we can work around the other things here. <clears throat> so let's look at just the word doctrine itself. A definition here, the systematic study of truth so that our understanding and notice that breaks down this way is as complete as possible. We want our understanding to be comprehensive. We want to, someone to know uh, that we know. Uh, during the summer, 
I had Achilles tendon surgery. I wanted to know that that surgeon knew what he was doing so that things are going to get put back together the way he said they would. Uh, we want our truth uh, to be so that we understand in a way that is integrated. We see how the parts fit together. As we look at the Bible itself, we want to understand how the Old Testament fits with the New Testament. This understanding is personally developed. It's relevant to us. This is important to me and that it can be described to others. It's explainable. We're told, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, to go out and teach all men. I can't teach what I don't understand. So notice in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Paul refers to the word doctrine no fewer than 16 times. Uh, there in your notes, you can see give attendance, take heed, will not endure sound doctrine. These are all phrases that will come from the King James. So as I use verse phrases here in the notes, they are King James. Uh, you're welcome to look at others acceptable versions. Our verse quizzes will be King James or NASB. But notice here, uh, we're going to, uh, as Paul talks about doctrine, that this doctrine in Titus he mentioned speaking sound doctrine, a doctrine that was going to edify the saints, a big word meaning to build others up. Again, if we're going to teach something about, especially about God and his word, we wanted to encourage others to grow in their knowledge of God and his word. And sometimes in order to do that, we've got to combat the false teaching that's in the church. You know, we're going to have to make sure that people understand why something else is not right. It does not agree with scripture. So notice here it also talks about forms of false doctrine. And for many of these, for sake of time with the notes here this way, I'll leave the verses for you to look up, but there could be people that's false because they deny, they don't want to listen to scripture, or they decide they're going to add to. <clears throat> there were men that <clears throat> Paul spoke against because they were adding to scripture in a way that was telling people that the resurrection had already happened. They had missed it. That was not a good thing. People taking away from God's word Things don't mean what they really mean, misrepresenting it, substituting. All of these are errors that cause people to stumble or even worse, turn away from God. Okay? So we want to look at the doctrine of the Bible specifically. So even that first introduction notes, those aren't necessarily something that have to be included in your statement. Your first statement is going to begin with a doctrine of the Bible. Um, and Bible and inspiration are sort of tied together, so they could be one larger statement, or you could choose to have a paragraph on each, and that'll work fine. But what is it about the doctrine of the Bible? There's a presupposition that we start with, and really you could almost go either way here. Do I start with the doctrine of the Bible and presuppose that there is God, or do I start with the doctrine of God but where am I finding about him, about him? Well, it's in the Bible. So I'm going to presuppose either God is and God has spoken, and therefore I'm going to believe that the Bible is, is his word and I'm going to move forward, or I am going to need to believe that the Bible and what the Bible has said about him, or I presuppose that there's... So they're intertwined. Um, but we're looking here, first of all, at the Bible because the Bible is where we are finding out about uh, God. And this is just a couple of things here as we start, that God is. Hebrews 11.6, that the existence of God is a determinate fact of history. You know, what we believe, and we're going to believe this by faith because we have not seen God. Uh, we did not see the acts of God that did creation, as we'll get to that later on. Also, presupposition that God has spoken, and notice where he's spoken, in nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. In man's conscience, we have a conscience, we're told. It speaks to us, but we can deny that conscience when it's telling us that what we're doing is wrong, that what we're doing is sin. I can sear it with a hot iron and say, I'm going to ignore it. Um, and I can 
confess to, to doing that far too many times in my own personal life. In the incarnate word, <clears throat> God has spoken. You know, when you just begin John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, we're going to look at that in more detail in inspiration, but that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And 2 Peter 1.20 and 21 telling us that no man is to interpret that scripture on his own. I don't have some private interpretation that's unique to me. It's God's word and the Holy Spirit's going to help me to understand it. Now the contents of the Bible, if you were in class, then I would probably just stop here and start to say, okay, what do we know about the basics of the Bible? How is it uh, uh, divided up? What's it like? What's it telling us? Well, here we look at the contents of this one complete book. It bears witness to one God. Okay, let me change this for you here. It's bearing witness to one God. It forms one continuous story. It predicts the future. Think about the things that are still to come that Revelation talks about. There's a progressive unfolding of truth. You know, when Genesis 3.15 we'll look at and Adam and Eve are told that there's going to come a Messiah. Well, that truth unfolded over thousands of years about Christ's coming and we look back now a couple of thousand years at that with this one plan of redemption. But at that time, when the first son was born, you know, Adam and Eve, especially Eve, was thinking, hey, I, he's come. And it wasn't the case. There's one central theme with Scripture, and that central theme is Jesus Christ himself. The Old Testament pointing to it, the New Testament looking at what he's done and then how he's working through the church. And that this scripture is only understood by spiritual means. In fact, 2 Corinthians tells us to the unsaved person, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. It doesn't make sense. Look then at the canon. And the canon is simply a word talking about definition, a measuring rod, something we judge by. You know, over time, over those first hundred, few hundred years, people were disagreeing and people were adding. And so finally... You know, they started to sit down and say, you know, what can we really agree on out of all that's been written is God's word, that it is scriptural. Um, but, you know, the books were a measuring rod when they were written. They were given by God, but God has then protected these books to be the books that we were going to uh, take and make into our Bible, so to speak. The Old Testament, 39 books, mostly written in Hebrew, uh, Daniel and Ezra, partly Aramaic, uh, mostly written in the country of Israel, although you can see some exceptions because of the time periods when writers were in exile themselves. Now the Jews look at the Old Testament, they simply divide it into three parts here. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, we would look at it as the law, uh, books of poetry, uh, there are books of history, and then you've got your major prophets, your minor prophets uh, as well. Now then there were a group of books called the apocryphal books that were looked at that the Catholic Church accepts, and we don't have in our Bible. They are books that came out in the 400 years between the book of Malachi, the book of Matthew. Um, the doctrine in them is inconsistent. Um, give you a couple of ideas here. Second Maccabees chapter 12 verses 40 to 45 basically talks about being able to pray for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. And then Second Maccabees chapter 14 there's a passage that makes it appear that God uh, justifies suicide. Now, we're not saying that su suicide causes you to lose your salvation, but simply that God was going to be, uh, this particular man was going to be justified because he did. But uh, in this case, a man was 
about to be captured, and he attempted to fall on um, fall on his own sword. He misses. He runs up a wall. He jumps over the wall. Uh, he's still not dead, and eventually he reaches in and he pulls out his own insides and dies. And you know, said God's going to justify me. Well. That wasn't in agreement with all that Scripture said about suicide. Uh, that's not something that God wants us to do. Again, it's not to say that someone's going to lose their salvation. Now let's move on over. This is will be on your page three. Um, let me back up on my page here. What did we do here? Oh, the bottom of page two here, the New Testament after the apocryphal books that we are not looking at here, but the New Testament, 27 books written in Greek. Uh, a far shorter amount of time was used in the writing of these books. Okay. But eventually they had to agree that what was written agreed with what the apostles were saying. So the principles of canonicity, there on your page three. Okay. Notice what it says about inspiration. Does this book bear internal marks of inspiration? Does it edify saints? Does the Holy Spirit speak through this book? So there has to be God's authority behind this book. Notice that chapter divisions came about in the 13th century. You can't quite see it here on the screen. Let me adjust the, this just a little bit. But the verse divisions were in the 16th century if you're looking at the notes. Now, again, we're going to shorten our time down here on this. That's because this would be a part here about manuscripts, ancient translations, that are not necessary for you to include in your own uh, doctrinal statement. You know, this is uh, not so much what you want to look at. Probably here, best thing to do is, you know, what would you say is that important um, version of the Bible to you? Why is that version that you use, the NASB, the King James, the ESV, why is it important to you? Are you of a Catholic background and so you do hold to the apocryphal books? You know, why? Because this is your statement, okay? Um, my main thing is I want to see what you believe. I want you to state what you believe. I want you to back it up with the scripture. Scripture references, don't try to write out Bible verses to make your paper longer. That's that's not necessary. On the bottom of page three of your notes, you see the manuscripts, ancient translations, how that, that over time, uh, in some cases, some of these manuscripts were lost, some of them were refound, um, some of them were looked at as being unimportant. Uh, when you look on page four at the Codex Sinaiticus here, uh, you can see where even the Russians, once they became, uh, in 1862, they're financing publication of it, but by the 19th, 1933s, they're, they're selling it. They become communists. They don't believe in God. Okay? Ancient translations. The Septuagint there, page 4 in the middle, Greek translation of the Old Testament, 70, 72 individual translations here. Um, Latin Vulgate. This was the official Bible of the Catholic Church for a thousand years. Again, the difficulty there for the individual people was that the Bible wasn't in their own language. 15th to 16th century, the Pope of Rome commissions Erasmus to form a Greek text and manuscripts that are coming into the West uh, during the Renaissance. Then you get the important English translations here. Wycliffe in 1382, Tyndale 1526, Coverdale, 1535. Some of these individuals, as they did these translations, then ended up in trouble with the Catholic Church and ended up, in some cases, dying. Um, King James Version, 1611. Again, interesting, the Roman Catholic Bible being used, because it better agrees with the original text, called the Dewey Reims, um, Again, not so important in your statement. 
easier to write a statement than it is to take uh, a test that's covering all these highlighted notes. Um, revised version. Uh, number nine here, oldest manuscript now available. It was only New Testament attempt to revise the King James American Standard Version 1901, but notice the copyrights owned by the Jehovah's Witness who are looking at their Messiah having come much later in the 1900s. Second Timothy 3.16 they said maybe all scripture isn't inspired. Same thing happens with the Revised Standard Version. Maybe all scripture isn't inspired. Maybe Christ isn't virgin born. Uh, New American Standard, 1971 at the time, considered the best modern translation. Um, good one that's come out more recent years, the English Standard Version uh, being used as well. So these are important things, but Basically, for your statement, you're not trying to make a comparison of them at that point. You're simply trying to say, this is what I believe. Now, as far as this first test in a written statement, we're also going to include the doctrine of inspiration. So this is continuing into that at this time. Now, you got this big, long definition by Galson. Um, this is not really something to try to fit into yours. Make it much simpler. But notice what he said, that inexplicable power by which the divine spirit put forth of old on the authors of Holy Scripture in order to guide even in the employment of the words they used and to preserve them alike from all error and from all omission. A uh, much simpler idea here is that all of this inspiration applies to all of Scripture, all 66 books, and a couple important words to keep in mind you may hear at some point, verbal plenary. Every word and every word meaning equally inspired. Everything is important. Uh, you may hear it mentioned every jot and tittle, the two smallest marks in the Hebrew language. A simpler definition here in the middle of page six, the ministry of God guaranteeing the accuracy of his revelation as it is put into writing. Inspiration is the word theopneustos. In the Greek, it means God breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, your key verse there. It needs to be in your statement. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And as such, it is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. That's our, our teaching. It's profitable for reproof. Where am I wrong? For correction. How do I make it right? For instruction in righteousness. How do I stay right? Okay. Another term that comes out in this period of time here is that term revelation, the act of God by which he directly reveals truth to man which would otherwise be unknown. Revelation reveals new truth, inspiration superintends the communicating of that truth. So inspiration is saying I'm going to give you this new truth. I'm going to give it to you in this way. And we get this new truth, but I need to understand it. That's the illumination. How do I understand this new truth I'm given? That's going to come through the work of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to understand. And this truth is going to come with authority, God's authority backing it up, saying, this is why you should do it. Now, sometimes we don't respond well to a stranger because we don't think they have any authority over us. But when we recognize that authority, then we respond so look at the testimony of Scripture to its own inspiration and inerrancy, the testimony of Christ. The words of Christ are of absolute authority. Notice what he said in Matthew 24, 35, not one jot or one tittle shall pass away. There are those smallest marks. John 15, 7, my words will abide in you. John 14, 23 through 26, he told them to keep his words. They're important. You know, Luke 24, 25 through 27, he's on that road to Emmaus with these, and he's going from Scripture and showing how Scripture is important. What about the Old Testament? Thus saith the Lord appears over 3,800 times. This is from the King James way of saying it, but it's important. God said it. Okay? Again, some key, word, key verse phrases here, key Verse references, 2 Peter 1.21, 1.20, 1.21, 1 
that all scripture has been given to men to write down by guidance of the Holy Spirit and interpretation is by that same guidance. It's God breathed. Okay, so it's coming from God. The basis of our faith, it's objective. If I'm going to believe in a resurrection of what the Bible says, then I've got to believe that I can trust every word that's been given. It's the experience of our salvation as well. I've got to trust that what God has said is so. Otherwise, I'm going to discard it. I'm going to look for something else. But it's all by faith. Even the atheist is choosing by faith to believe what he believes as an atheist. Some various positions here. Again, this isn't necessarily something to include, but we look at it here. Neo-Orthodox, it becomes the Word of God when it speaks to me personally. So if it's not speaking to me, it's not God's Word. We don't want to believe that way. Liberals, it may contain the Word of God. It may not. Again, I'm going to be able to deny things. A new evangelical here, this thought is it's the, love is the most important thing. So it doesn't necessarily matter what everybody's beliefs. Now, this isn't, there are kind of generalizations here, so keep that in mind. The fundamentalist, it's the word of God and is to be obeyed. The fundamentalist can get to an extreme, and he's about rules. And so we have to be careful about letting that happen to us as well. Now, this very, very quickly has covered Bible and inspiration. We'll take far more class days uh, to uh, rabbit trail, if you will. But as you are out and you need to kind of get an overview of what this is, again, as you look at different aspects in the notes, look up some of the more of the scripture references so you're getting more detail. If we're being live in the classroom, then this just becomes something you can go to if needed to kind of fill in what you might have missed. Keep in mind, look at Google Classroom for dates that of, of assignments that are due so that you're following that. This is strictly just a way for you to get the teaching on the notes themselves. Um, and then look for the date for when you're going to write a statement. Again, Bible and inspiration together, one statement making up one test grade. And from here we'll be moving on. Keep in mind uh, the 12 ordinary men we're going to look at in a little bit different way here in a moment. Um, I'll pull that up and do a brief uh, YouTube on it probably uh, so that I can get to a different set of notes. Um, in fact, I'm going to just walk away from this and change my notes here and then come in. We'll jump right into it. We're looking at the bottom of page 7 and John MacArthur's book, Twelve Ordinary Men. This is just an introduction. As you look at those 12 men, they span the political spectrum. You've got Simon the Zealot, who wants to overthrow the Roman government by any means, violence if necessary, all the way to Matthew the tax collector who's working for the Romans. Uh, Christ knew all about them. He knew their faults long before he ever chose them, okay? Remember this, he said he saw Nathaniel coming. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel's like, how did you know me? Well, when you were under the tree, I knew you. What about this one from John 6, 70? Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Would you knowingly choose somebody who's going to be in opposition to you? But their most outstanding characteristic was that they were ordinary. He did not choose his men that were going to follow him, especially these 12, from the religious leaders of the day. Notice that they were taught by Christ. They saw great things with Christ, like the transfiguration. In the end, they still all ran away when he was arrested. Uh, most of them 
so far away we don't see them again till the upper room. Uh, after the crucifixion, they appeared to fail even with fishing. They said, "We're going." Peter said, I'm going fishing. I'm going with you. And they caught nothing. Even after all this, Christ was still not finished with them. They're living proof that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. They're called disciples. The word disciples mean learners, students. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, Matthew 10, 1. Then later he's going to call them apostles. Now they're messengers, they're sent ones. They're to go out and carry the message. When it was day, he called unto him uh, the twelve disciples from Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. They were called to the specific office of being an apostle. Uh, Paul was called to that office in Acts 14, 14, although it was at a later time. He said one born out of due time. The number 12 appears to be significant for the apostles because Matthias did, was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot. Now their role as apostles was to have authority to teach. Uh, they were going to be gifted with the miracles so that people would recognize, hey, these guys have some power. They have some authority. Um, and then when people did follow them, notice Acts 2.42 it says that the people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Um, again, we've mentioned the idea from Acts 2, again, that they start performing miracles, uh, even just beginning uh, with Pentecost to start speaking in other foreign languages that they did not know. Um, all of these things being miracles so people would respond to them. They're the foundation of the church, but Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Notice Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone for a building at that time was critical towards making sure that the building was going to be square and it was going to go up straight. Very critical. That's true about Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone. Now what will happen with this particular a little very tiny short study on the introduction to the book is that you will have a written quiz on this at a given date. So watch for that date. But you will study here then the highlighted notes. Now you'll note that this was a different PowerPoint. They're not highlighted. So be sure that you pay attention to your set of notes for the highlights there on pages 7 and 8 for that quiz. And watch for the date for that quiz.